This is the Kimlin lecture over covalent bonding. So covalent bonds are formed um, when atoms share electrons and um, those particles are called molecules. Molecules um, have electrons that they share. Um, and there's two different ways that uh, atoms can share their electrons. They can be shared equally or unequally. So if it's shared equally, that means at any given moment in time, that electron would be over around one x electron, but maybe um, oxygen atom over the other. So if it's shared evenly 50% of the time, it'd be with one atom, and 50% of the time that a shared electron would be um, with the other atom. Um, that is called nonpolar covalent, um, that electron is shared equally. The opposite of that would be if they were shared unequally. So now we have a hydrogen and oxygen. Um, if you look at where they are on the periodic table, you can see that they have very different electronegativities. Oxygen is much more electronegative. So that electron is going to be found orbiting around the oxygen way more frequently than it's going to be found around the hydrogen. So this is very uneven sharing. You could even assign, we can make up some percents. We could say um, that 98% of the time that electron is found around the oxygen, maybe only 2% of the time it's going to be found around the hydrogen. That is very uneven. So it's called polar covalent. Um, and that's because you actually end up with poles. So within this, since the electron is found around oxygen more often, you could say that oxygen would have kind of an overall slight negative charge. Because um, it's got that one extra electron. And hydrogen, exact opposite. It's kind of short an electron 98% of the time, right? It's only got it 2% of the time. So you could say that over here, it's got a partial positive charge. We'll go into a lot more detail on this later, but that's why it's called polar covalent, because we actually have poles. We have a negative pole and we have a positive pole here. Nonpolar is just that. There are no poles. Since there's an even, um, even sharing here, there is no distinct positive or negative side. Um, so back to the polar covalent, which you predict to be more like ionic bond, will it be the one where there's uneven sharing. Um, that's also I want to point out that there's a full spectrum to this, um, that it's not just one or the other. Some things tend to be more nonpolar, some tend to be more polar. Uh, it's not black or white. Same thing when we go all the way over to ionic bonding. Um, we're teaching it to you guys pretty separately, but keep in mind there is a full spectrum. Some atoms, some bonds tend to be a little bit more even in their sharing. Some tend to be a little bit more uneven in their sharing. Um, it's not just one or the other. So we can determine the bond type. So um, we can label whether these are going to be um, I for ionic. Um, we're going to call instead of just covalent, it's going to be polar covalent, or that's our uneven sharing, or nonpolar covalent, that would be our perfectly even sharing. And this is going to happen if there's two of the same atom. That would be where we'd have perfectly even sharing. Um, they'd have identical electronegativity. They'd be pulling on those electrons equally. So our first option is sodium and chlorine. So to determine this, you'd have to find them on the periodic table to determine whether we're looking at metals or nonmetals or whatnot. Um, sodium is found in family number one. It's a metal. Chlorine, let's see, find on the periodic table. Um, it's atomic number 17. It's a nonmetal. So with a metal and a nonmetal, we have an ionic bond. It's a little hard to see. Um, next, we have S and SE. So if you look these guys up, they're both nonmetals, so we've got a nonmetal and a nonmetal. So this is definitely going to be a covalent bond, but the question is, is it going to be polar covalent or nonpolar covalent? Since those nonmetals are different, it would be considered polar covalent. Next we have um, hydrogen and oxygen. So um, I've got, now be careful with hydrogen, it is placed over where the metals are, but it is a non-metal. Oxygen is also a non-metal. So I've got two different, but um, they're two different non-metals. This would be considered a polar covalent bond. Next we have lithium and iodine. Um, let's see, lithium is a metal and iodine is a non-metal. So it's going to be covalent since they're, or, excuse me, not covalent, guys, right? If it's a metal and a nonmetal, it's going to be ionic. Um, next, let's see, we've got iron and chlorine. So iron is a metal and chlorine is a nonmetal. 
So same thing, metal and nonmetal, very different electronegativities would be considered ionic. And last we have chlorine and chlorine. So I've got chlorine, if you look it up, it's a nonmetal. So I've got a nonmetal and a nonmetal. Um, so it's definitely going to be covalent this time. The question is, if they're both the same with identical electronegativities, they would share perfectly evenly. So it's actually nonpolar covalent. So now let's go through and talk about the properties of compounds that contain covalent bonds. So we talked about this. They're going to have um, those elements in there are going to have similar electronegativities, right? They're both kind of pulling those electrons. Um, so they're both going to be nonmetals. Now we also talked about that if it's two of the same nonmetal, that it would be nonpolar covalent. Two different nonmetals, it's going to be polar covalent. At room temperature, um, covalent compounds can be solids, liquids, or gases. Um, and we're going to talk about more um, in the next unit as to why um, they can form solid liquids and gases. Um, it's a little bit beyond what we're talking about here, but just know that there's a full variety of states of matter that these compounds can have. Um, they do tend to have low melting points and high volatility. So this is opposite of ionic bonding. Low melting points, which means it doesn't take a lot of heat um, to make it go from a solid to a liquid. Um, volatility is the process of going from um, up to a gas, and so that means it's easily to vaporize. Um, and it actually has to do when we're melting covalent compounds, we don't need to break any bonds. So it's a little bit different than ionic. Um, and that's because covalent compounds uh, form these distinct molecules. Um, and those molecules don't interact with each other very much, um, except for these really weak forces called intermolecular forces. And don't worry, we're going to talk about this a lot more later. Um, but that means um, it has to do with they're pretty easily pulled apart from each other, which is why they're easily to, it's easy to melt them and easy to make them form a gas. They, they don't conduct electricity, um, so they're considered to be a non-electrolyte. So um, this is a similar image um, from the last lesson. Um, covalent compounds, we can see we've got our conductivity tester here. Um, notice that in this uh, covalent compound is not able to close the circuit and this light bulb does not light up. Same thing with an ionic compound, right? Remember, as a solid, it also does not conduct electricity. But if it's dissolved in water and you've got those movable positive and negative charges, the light bulb does light up. So um, Lewis structures are going to look a little bit different um, with uh, covalent compounds as opposed to ionic compounds. Remember, ionic compounds, there was a transfer of electrons. We used a lot of arrows to show the metals giving away their electrons and nonmetals gaining them. And then we put them in brackets with charges. This is going to be a little bit different. Um, since they're sharing electrons, we have to show bonded electrons and non-bonded electrons. So we use a dash to represent bonded electrons. So here's some bonded electrons and here's some bonded electrons. Um, electrons that aren't involved in bonding um, are called lone pairs and they're drawn as two lone dots, right? So here's a lone pair and here's a lone pair. So we show them a little bit differently. So we do need to do a little bit of work um, to figure out um, which electrons would be bonded and which ones um, would not be. So first let's talk about electrons and bonds. So this dash right here represents a bond. It's where one electron from hydrogen and one from oxygen is somehow here being shared. And we know it's two different nonmetals, so they're not being shared evenly, but they are technically being shared. Hydrogen's giving one to the bond, oxygen's giving one to the bond, and those, those two are being shared collectively between them. So um, if a bond um, has two electrons, so one from each atom, so up here we've got hydrogen, we've got an H and an H, um, we've got one electron from one atom, one from the other, they're being shared, that's considered a single bond, and it's drawn with one dash, which we'll get to in a second. Um, if you have four electrons, that means two, so we've got two of the yellow guys here in oxygen, and we've got two green guys, um, that means in order to fulfill these octets, each oxygen has to put in two electrons, but ends up getting four since they're being shared. Triple bond, then same idea, but it contains six, three from each. Um, so um, to draw a Lewis structure, we've got to be able to calculate how many of these atoms are being shared in bonds and how many are not. So here we've got our steps. Um, number one, we need to determine the number of bonds needed. I'm using the formula. Um, so N stands for the number of needed electrons. Um, so all elements pretty much want eight, right? That's that magic number, that octet. Um, there are a couple of exceptions you need to know. Um, hydrogen only needs two to become stable, and boron only needs six. Um, so I always have a little rhyme that boron is a moron, that for some reason that we're not going to talk about in this class, um, it is stable with only six valence electrons. 
Um, A stands for the number of available electrons, which is the sum of all of the valence electrons. So now we can just use our periodic tables, look up, figure out how many valence electrons they actually have available that are possible to bond. S stands for shared. Um, so we get this little formula. It's how many that were needed. Subtract out how many actually are available. And um, since that's the number of shared electrons, and we know that there's two per bond, that divided by two is just to figure out the number of bonds. And then the last step is your lone pair. So it's saying, hey, here's how many I have available. Let's subtract how many we just said we're going to be involved in bonds in the shared, divide by two to get our pairs. So let's practice. Um, our compound is NH3. Um, so the number that are needed. So first I would go look through and I'd say, cool, this compound has one nitrogen and three hydrogen. It's got one nitrogen. Nitrogen needs eight valence electrons to fulfill its octet. And then I have three hydrogens. Each hydrogen needs two. Remember, that's our exception. So you could sit here and say plus two, plus two, plus two, um, cause there's three of them. Or of course you could always say, well, two times three, since there's three of them, either way it'll get you this right number. So eight plus, let's see, six is 14. So that means to fulfill all these atoms, oct um, octets, I need 14 electrons. Well, A stands for how many are available? How many can we actually have um, hanging out? Well, if you look in your periodic tables, nitrogen is in family 15, so it has five valence electrons. And then for our hydrogens, it's in family number one, so each hydrogen has one valence electron. So I went ahead and wrote out one plus one plus one. You could also say, hey, there's three of them times each of them has one. Either way, it'll get you three, add it all together and we get eight. So this tells me that I need 14 electrons to fulfill everybody's octets. I only have eight. Well, to figure out then how many of those need to be shared, we subtract those numbers and we're gonna get six. That means six electrons have to be shared. Well, how many bonds is that? Well, you divide it by two and we would get, hey, there's three bonds. Last is lone pairs. So, well, I had eight available electrons and we just used up six of them in our bonds. Be careful not to subtract the number of bonds, but actually the number of electrons involved in bonds. And we're gonna get two. So how many pairs is that? Divided by two, we get one lone pair. So we did all of this to determine that, hey, we're gonna have to draw three sets of bonded electrons, right? Well, each of them are two, and then one lone pair of electrons. And we're gonna do all this to fulfill all four of these atoms, the nitrogen and three hydrogens octets. So next we need to actually draw the skeleton structure. Now, the technical rule is that the least electronegative atom goes in the center. The only exception to that is hydrogen. Hydrogen doesn't ever go around the center because it only needs, remember it's one of the exceptions, it only needs two electrons, which means it won't form ever more than one bond. So if you put it in the middle, you're gonna run out of places to put other atoms. Um, there are more complicated uh, Lewis structures we're not, um, that are ringed and whatnot that we're not gonna cover in this class. Just be aware that if you take chemistry courses in the future, you may be asked to do things that are more complicated. Um, you've gotta connect the atoms with the number of bonds. Calculating step one of those are gonna be our dashes. Finish by making sure all atoms in the structure have an octet. And again, we got our exceptions, hydrogen and boron. We're gonna talk about polyatomic ions in a minute. So here um, we've got our, by the way, N-A-S-L spells NASL. So you may hear your teacher say that. Um, and we did all of that work to say, hey, cool, three bonds, one lone pair of electrons. So first thing we need to do is we need to put our least electronegative element in the middle, which means it's gonna be furthest from fluorine. Another handy hint um, in covalent, um, formulas, the least electronegative thing is listed first, the exception being hydrogen sometimes. So nitrogen is going to go in the center. It's listed first. It's also furthest away from fluorine. So now um, basically I've got four sides here. Let's kind of highlight these. So I've got four basic sides, right? One, two, three, four on here. And I can place um, atoms on either of those four sides or other atoms, um, but I only have three. So um, it doesn't matter which three sides you pick. There is no up, down, or left, or right in a molecule. So got my three hydrogens here. And we said, cool, three bonds. One, two, three. I've got three spaces for them. Now I need to figure out where to put that lone pair of electrons. And I've got lots of empty spaces around these guys to put the electrons. But remember, remember, um, are exceptions, right? Hydrogen, so nitrogen needs, nitrogen needs eight electrons and each of these hydrogens needs two. So let's go around. This first hydrogen here has one bond around it, right? That is two electrons, which tells me that this hydrogen is actually 
stable. And now you don't need to write this down, but this guy, I'm going to put a little dot or check. Here we go. That guy is stable. It's got a full, well, it's full with two electrons. Well, let's go look at this other hydrogen. This guy down here, it's got one bond around it. That's two electrons. So, hey, this guy is stable too. I'm going to put a little check there. That guy's good. Again, please don't put checks. This is just to show you guys where I am. Um, and this hydrogen, same thing. It needs two. It's got two in that guy. So this guy, oh, also stable. Okay, well, I need to figure out that lone pair is going to go. Let's go in the center. Let's look at nitrogen. Right now, nitrogen has one, two, three bonds around it. That represents two, four, six electrons. It's almost there, right? It needs eight. It's got six, but it does need two more electrons. So this is where our two dots are going to go. So now nitrogen is stable because it's got two, four, six, eight electrons around it. So remember, at the end, we need to make sure every element has eight electrons around it, whether it's in bonds or whether it's lone pairs. The exceptions are hydrogen and boron, right? So hydrogen only needs two electrons and boron is a moron because it only needs six. Let's try another practice. I've got CCl4, carbon tetrachloride. So M, N stands for needed. That magic number is eight. All elements need eight except for hydrogen and boron. Let's check it out. I don't have a hydrogen or a boron. So let's start off with carbon. Carbon needs eight and I have four chlorines. And sure, I could write eight plus eight plus eight plus eight here. Or, hey, how about let's try this. Let's try four times eight. So do the math, you can look at this and say, hey, eight plus four times eight, or say, hey, that's five eighths. I know that that's 40 electrons that are needed. A stands for the number of available. That's our number of valence electrons. So you're gonna have to pull out a periodic table. Find carbon, it's in family number 14. So I know it's got four valence electrons. And next I have chlorine, and again, there's four of them. Each of them has seven valence electrons. So let's see, four times seven is 28, plus four is 32 available. So to figure out how many are shared, we have to subtract those numbers. 40 minus 32 gives me eight. How many bonds that would be? It would be four, since there's two per bond. So it means out of the 32 available electrons, eight of them are going to be used in bonds. So 32 minus eight gives us 20. Four. Same thing, divided by two is going to give us oh, a lot, 12 lone pairs. So um, now we've got to draw our skeleton structure. Um, carbon is listed first, so it's gonna go in the center. If you look at it on the periodic table, it's also further away from fluorine. So we're gonna put carbon in the middle and I've got to put chlorines around it and there's four sides and there's four chlorine atoms. So we're gonna use all four spots. And if you check it out, it actually says that we need four bonds. Well, and I've got four spots for bonds. So one, two, three, four bonds. Now I need to figure out where those lone pairs need to go. So remember, I've got to get these guys. All these guys need eight. So let's start. I'm going to start in the center this time. Carbon here in the middle. It's got two, four, six, eight electrons in it, right? So there's four bonds, that's eight valence electrons. So carbon does not need any lone pairs around it. Let's go to a chlorine, this chlorine here, it needs eight, it's got two right here in the bond, so that means it needs six more. So put three pairs around it, that would give me six electrons. Guess what? Each chlorine here is in the same situation. With only one bond around it, that's two electrons, it needs three more pairs to get up to eight. So now this, oop, forgot the last one up there. Oh, I forget that guy. There we go. So now we can double check each chlorine. It has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight valence electrons, right? Two, four, six, eight. So now everybody is stable. Everybody's happy with the um, eight valence electrons. Now let's go back and answer this question. It's asking about the bond type. Well, we know it's a covalent bond because it's two nonmetals. The question is, is it polar or nonpolar covalent? Well, it's actually polar covalent since it's two different atoms with two different electronegativities.
Next, we've got another one, um, H2CO. So we need to go through and do um, our NASL calculation. So N stands for needed. There's two hydrogens. Each of them needs two. Remember, that's an exception. So I got two times two here. Then I've got a carbon. It needs eight and an oxygen that also needs eight. So let's see, that's four plus 16. That gives me a total of 20 that are needed. A stands for available. That's your number of valence electrons. I've got hydrogen here. I've got two of them, but each of them have one valence electron. Carbon has, let's see, four, so plus four, plus oxygen that has six. So that's going to be 12 available. So that means if there's 20 that are needed, but we only have 12, that means eight are gonna have to be shared. So we're going to again divide that by two to get our bonds. It's going to be four bonds. So that means of the 12 available, we've just used up eight. That gives me four left for our lone pairs. Divide that by two is going to give me only two pairs of dots. So now let's think about what should go in the center. Hydrogen is listed first, but it should not go in the center since it, it's fulfilled with only two electrons at one bond. Uh, it won't go in the center. Let's put carbon in the center. Here's another hint, carbon, pretty much all the time you see carbon, it's gonna go in the middle. So put carbon, and I've got four sides around the carbon, it doesn't matter which sides we pick, but we gotta put, let's see, um, let's put an oxygen up top, and let's put a hydrogen on either side. Again, it doesn't matter how you orient them, in like a beaker of molecules, there is no up or down, so it doesn't matter. And now I've gotta place four bonds, but here's the problem, one, two, three. I got my, I got my bonds here, but I calculated that I need four, and there's only three here. So that means that one of these is going to be a double bond. Remember, that means there's four electrons shared. Well, um, and it, here's the catch. It's impossible to put a double bond here. Think about why. Hydrogen only needs two electrons. So this hydrogen is actually stable. All right, it's fulfilled. Same thing with this hydrogen. It can't contain any more electrons, which means the only option here for us to put a double bond is to the oxygen. So we're actually going to show double bond by putting two lines there. I've now drawn four bonds, and I've determined that, hey, those hydrogens can't have any lone pairs, but I do have two lone pairs to, to place. Let's look in the center first. We said hydrogens are good. Let's look at carbon. Carbon right here has one, two, three, four bonds around it. Remember, these two dashes are two separate bonds. One, two, three, four. So it's stable. It's got four bonds. That's eight electrons. I can't put, even though there's a nice little spot here, we cannot put a lone pair of electrons down there. Carbon is stable. So that means I sure hope we can put it around oxygen. Oxygen here has no lone pairs. It's got two bonds around it. So it's got two, four electrons. It needs eight. This is where those extra electrons are going to go. And it doesn't matter which side you pick as long as you put them together. Now we've got to ask, answer these questions about bond types. So both of these bond types, let's see, CO and HC, right? So we've got a C to O bond right here, and we've got a C to H bond here. So this molecule contains two types of bonds. Both of them contain all nonmetals, but are two different nonmetals. So both of these would be polar covalent bonds. So our last example looks a little bit different. This guy has a charge hanging out up here, and that's because it's a polyatomic ion. Um, so the term ion, right, means a charged particle, polyatomic meaning multiple atoms because it contains a sulfur and three oxygen. So let's talk about polyatomic ions. Um, so towards the center of your page, you've got to define this. So a polyatomic ion, um, is a group of covalently bonded atoms with an overall charge. And since it has a charge, it becomes involved in ionic bonding. So it's kind of trippy because it itself contains covalent bonds, but overall then acts in ionic bonds, which we'll spend a little bit more time talking about later. If that ion has a negative charge, that's because it's gained electrons we need to adjust. And the only letter we need to adjust are the number of available, that A part of NASL. If it has a positive charge, we know it's because it's a lost electrons, we'll have to adjust it there. Um, once you, you've used the, um, you've changed the A um, to illustrate its charge, the other thing you need to do is you need to place a completed structure in brackets with the charge outside of it saying, hey, this um, SO4 thing here has gained two electrons. It's got a negative two charge, or here, this NH4 thing, it's lost one electron, it's now got a plus one charge. So it's a little bit different. So let's go back to the example. So 
Um, SO3 minus 2. The only thing we need to change is the A step. So we're going to do the in the needed step exactly the same. So SO3, S, all these guys need 8. S needs 8, and then I've got 3 oxygens. And you could write 8 times 3, or you could actually write out plus 8 plus 8 plus 8. doesn't matter. 4 8 8 times 4 gives us 32 that are needed. Now A's are available. First, let's just add up our number of valence electrons. Sulfur has six valence electrons. If we look up oxygen, each of these guys has six valence electrons. So plus six, plus six, plus six, plus six. So there's our four atoms there. But now we need to adjust for the polyatomic ion. Now here's the catch. It's got a negative two charge. That's because it has gained two electrons. So we need to add two electrons to this. So that negative two gets adjusted down here by adding two more electrons to it. Now if it had been a plus two, I would have subtracted two because I know it's got a positive charge because it's lost two electrons. So now I have one, two, three, six times four is 24. Add two more to that, that gives us 26. That is the only thing that's different. So shared, same idea, you to subtract these numbers, 32 minus 26. 32 minus 26 gives us six electrons, so that gives us three bonds. Now we've got to cut the lone pairs, we're going to have to take that 26, subtract out the six in bonds, that gives me 20, ooh, lots of lone pairs, i got 10 lone pairs to draw. So um, we're going to have to put sulfur in the middle. And I've got three oxygens. It does not matter which three sides you choose. Now I need to put three bonds here. Well, great. There's three spots. That means there's no double or triple bonds. Now we need to start placing our lone pairs of electrons. I usually like to start in the middle, but it doesn't make a difference. Um, so sulfur hanging out here has got one, two, three bonds around it. So it's got two, four, six pairs of electrons, or total electrons, so it only needs one more pair to fulfill its octet. So now sulfur's got two, four, six, eight valence electrons. Now oxygens, each of these guys are in an identical situation that it has one dash, so it's got one pair of electrons, or two of them total. So these guys each need three pairs of electrons to fulfill its octet. Lots of little dots here. So now to show that this thing has overall gained two electrons, put it in brackets and put the charge outside of it. And the bond type here would still be polar covalent since we're dealing with two nonmetals but that have um, different identities, they're different atoms.